Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, Jonathan and I bring you reports along with Faith Perlow. She answers an English question from a learner in Turkey. We close with an American story. This week, it is a municipal report by O. Henry. But first, here is Jonathan. On a recent day, Behez and Nabaz Farouk Ali were on Bamo Mountain in Iraq's Kurdistan area. The brothers hoped to make video recordings of a Persian leopard. It is believed there are only about 1,000 of the animals left in the wild. Our grandparents saw some even during the day, Nabaz said. Since then, the animals have almost all disappeared. Most Persian leopards are in Iran and Afghanistan. Iraqi Kurdish conservationist Hana Raza estimates there may be 25 left in Iraq. The International Union for Conservation of Nature lists the animal as endangered. Conservationists in Iraqi Kurdistan support increased efforts to protect the leopard. The animals are threatened by a severe loss of habitat, human interference, hunting, and the effects of war. Soren Ahmed is a biologist at the University of Sulaymaniya. He said about 10 different Persian leopards had been recorded. But he added that ten others have been found dead in the last ten years, two of them shot by bullets. The Ali brothers had left their village of Horen to escape former President Saddam Hussein's violent campaign against the Kurds. When they returned in 1991, they found the village empty and partly destroyed. When people returned to their villages, they also started to hunt randomly, Nabaz said. Hunting of the leopard's prey, such as wild goats, helped lead to a decrease in their numbers. Hunting of endangered animals is not permitted in Iraq's Kurdish area. Anyone caught illegally hunting can be fined. But forest police official Akram Saleh said the laws can be difficult to enforce. The area is very large, and we don't have the necessary resources to cover it, he said. Hunters have better weapons, better cars than us. In parts of Bamo Mountain, Landmines have kept humans and cows away from some areas where leopards live, Nabaz said. The mines make researchers' work more dangerous. Animals in the area are also affected. Data from the Kurdistan regional government show that the Kurdish area lost almost half of its forest between 1999 and 2018. That caused a severe loss in the leopard's habitat. Razak Al-Kalani is a spokesperson for the KRG Board of Environment. He said a lack of public money for conservation and conflicts in the area have stopped some efforts. Soren Ahmed said places like Bamo Mountain, if effectively protected, could become a breeding site for the leopards. He added, We have to save them. They are part of our culture and identity.
Many places around the world are known for their curry dishes. Curry is a kind of sauce that is highly seasoned and sometimes spicy. The sauce is usually combined with vegetables and meat and served over rice. Some of the best known curries come from India and Thailand. Other countries in Asia, including Indonesia and Japan, also have their own special curry dishes. South Africa is not so well known for its curry, but food expert Christopher Kimball recently praised a curry he found in Cape Town. He wrote recently about the dish called Cape Malay in a piece for the Associated Press. Kimball describes Cape Malay curry as somewhat similar to Indian curry, but it is lighter in flavor or taste. Kimball learned about making the dish from cooking teacher Faldela Tolker. She told him the spices used in Cape Malay curry are similar to those in Indian curry, but they are used differently. They are not ground fine like they are in Indian curry. Cape Malay curry uses the whole form of each spice. After the sauce is cooked, the individual pieces of spice are removed. The result is a lighter, brighter, milder curry than most people are used to, Kimball notes. Kimball included a recipe for Cape Malay chicken curry in his new cookbook, Milk Street Tuesday Nights. Here is how you can make Cape Malay curry for yourself. First, mix spices together. You will need 15 milliliters each of whole fennel and cumin seeds, and 5 milliliters each of turmeric, salt, and pepper. Put about 15 milliliters of the spice mixture onto uncooked chicken. Boneless, skinless chicken pieces called thighs work best, Kimball says. Next, heat some cooking oil in a large pan. Add two medium-sized onions cut into small pieces. Cook them for 8 to 10 minutes until they are lightly browned. Then add in four cloves of chopped garlic, two serrano chili peppers cut in half, and about 100 grams of fresh ginger. About 30 seconds later, add in about 500 milliliters of chicken broth and 500 milliliters of cherry tomatoes, along with two whole cinnamon sticks, two bay leaves, and the rest of the spice mixture you prepared earlier. Then add the chicken thighs to the pan. Make sure the chicken is covered with the liquid. Bring the liquid to a simmer, then cover and cook for 25 minutes. Stir in about half a kilogram of potatoes, cut into small pieces. Cover the pan again and return to a simmer. Cook until the chicken and potatoes are soft, another 12 to 15 minutes. Safely remove the chicken from the pan and put it onto a large plate. Remove the ginger, cinnamon sticks, bay leaves, and chili halves. Continue to simmer over medium heat for another 5 minutes. Pull the chicken into bite-sized pieces, then return it to the pan and stir to combine. Stir in juice from one lemon, then taste the mixture and add additional salt and pepper if needed. After the cooking is finished, pour the curry mixture into a serving bowl and put fresh mint on top. Serve over basmati or jasmine rice. The lemony, richly flavored curry takes about one hour to prepare and serves six people. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question from Errol from Turkey. Hello, my name is Errol. What is the best way of learning words? I am very confused about the subject. 
Can you give me some advice about learning words, please? Thank you for emailing us this very important question, Errol. There are many ways to learn words in English. Over the next two weeks, we will talk about learning different parts of speech, or word families, and using suffixes. Many language teachers say there are eight different parts of speech in English. We will look at the four major parts of speech that include most content words. Nouns, adjectives, verbs, and adverbs. Nouns are people, places, things, or ideas. Adjectives are words that describe nouns. Verbs describe actions or states of being. And adverbs describe adjectives, verbs, or even other adverbs. In this simple sentence, we can see all four major parts of speech. Warm days have quickly come. Warm is the adjective that describes the noun days. Quickly is the adverb that describes have come, the verb in the sentence. We use suffixes after the base form or root of a word. The root is the simplest form of the word. We can use suffixes to change the meaning of words by adding them to the base form. So if we know one word, like a verb, we could use a suffix to change that part of speech to another part of speech. This idea is very helpful for learning new words. We can create several new words from a base form when we add suffixes. For example, if we have the verb to argue, we can add the suffix meant to make the noun argument. Or if we have a verb like create, we can add if to the end to make the adjective creative. In this case, we drop the final E at the end of the verb and add the suffix. To turn some nouns and adjectives into verbs, we can use the suffixes eyes or a phi. For example, beauty plus suffix a phi equal beautify. Remove the Y and add the suffix. Organization plus suffix eyes equal organize. We can drop the ending ation, a noun suffix, to get the base form. Then add eyes, the verbal ending. To turn some verbs into nouns, we can use the suffix er, meant, or ation. For example, argue plus suffix meant equal argument. Drop the e and add the suffix. Dance plus suffix er equal dancer. Create plus suffix ation equal creation. Drop the e and add the suffix. Some adjectives can also become nouns with suffixes itty or t. For example, responsible plus suffix itty equal responsibility. Drop the e and add the suffix. We can also use the suffixes ist or ism to make other nouns. For example, active plus suffix ist equal activist. Drop the e and add the suffix. Magnet plus ism equal magnetism. Some English teachers use a chart to show the possible words you can make using suffixes. Next week on Ask a Teacher, we will continue learning 
how to make new words by adding suffixes. And we will fill in the chart of words we have been talking about by making adjectives and adverbs with suffixes. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlow. Our story today is called A Municipal Report. It was written by O. Henry and first published in 1904. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. It was raining as I got off the train in Nashville, Tennessee. A slow, gray rain. I was tired, so I went straight to my hotel. A big, heavy man was walking up and down in the hotel lobby. Something about the way he moved made me think of a hungry dog looking for a bone. He had a big, fat, red face and a sleepy expression in his eyes. He introduced himself as Wentworth Caswell, Major Wentworth Caswell from a fine southern family. Caswell pulled me into the hotel's barroom and yelled for a waiter. We ordered drinks. While we drank, he talked continually about himself, his family, his wife, and her family. He said his wife was rich. He showed me a handful of silver coins that he pulled from his coat pocket. By this time, I had decided that I wanted no more of him. I said good night. I went up to my room and looked out the window. It was ten o'clock, but the town was silent. A nice, quiet place, I said to myself as I got ready for bed. Just an ordinary, sleepy, southern town. I was born in the South myself, but I live in New York now. I write for a large magazine. My boss had asked me to go to Nashville. The magazine had received some stories and poems from a writer in Nashville named Azalea Adair. The editor liked her work very much. The publisher asked me to get her to sign an agreement to write only for his magazine. I left the hotel at nine o'clock the next morning to find Miss Adair. It was still raining. As soon as I stepped outside, I met Uncle Caesar. He was a big old black man with fuzzy gray hair. Uncle Caesar was wearing the strangest coat I had ever seen. It must have been a military officer's coat. It was very long, and when it was new, it had been gray. But now, rain, sun, and age had made it a rainbow of colors. Only one of the buttons was left. It was yellow, and as big as a fifty-cent coin. Uncle Caesar stood near a horse and carriage. He opened the carriage door and said softly, Step right in, sir. I'll take you anywhere in the city. I want to go to 861 Jasmine Street, I said, and I started to climb into the carriage. But the old man stopped me. Why do you want to go there, sir? What business is it of yours, I said angrily. Uncle Caesar relaxed and smiled. Nothing, sir, but it's a lonely part of town. Just step in and I'll take you there right away. 861 Jasmine Street had been a fine house once, but now it was old and dying. I got out of the carriage. That will be two dollars, sir, Uncle Caesar said. I gave him two one-dollar bills. As I handed them to him, 
I noticed that one had been torn in half and fixed with a piece of blue paper. Also, the upper right-hand corner was missing. Azalea Adair herself opened the door when I knocked. She was about fifty years old. Her white hair was pulled back from her small, tired face. She wore a pale yellow dress. It was old, but very clean. Azalea Adair led me into her living room. A damaged table, three chairs, and an old red sofa were in the center of the floor. Azalea Adair and I sat down at the table and began to talk. I told her about the magazine's offer. She told me about herself. She was from an old southern family. Her father had been a judge. Azalea Adair told me she had never traveled or even attended school. Her parents taught her at home with private teachers. We finished our meeting. I promised to return with the agreement the next day and rose to leave. At that moment, someone knocked at the back door. Azalea Adair whispered a soft apology and went to answer the caller. She came back a minute later with bright eyes and pink cheeks. She looked ten years younger. You must have a cup of tea before you go, she said. She shook a little bell on the table, and a small black girl about twelve years old ran into the room. Azalea Adair opened a tiny old purse and took out a dollar bill. It had been fixed with a piece of blue paper, and the upper right-hand corner was missing. It was the dollar I had given to Uncle Caesar. Go to Mr. Baker's store, Impey, she said, and get me twenty-five cents worth of tea and ten cents worth of sugar cakes, and please hurry. The child ran out of the room. We heard the back door close. Then the girl screamed, her cry mixed with a man's angry voice. Azalea Adair stood up. Her face showed no emotion as she left the room. I heard the man's rough voice and her gentle one. Then a door slammed, and she came back into the room. I am sorry, but I won't be able to offer you any tea after all, she said. It seems that Mr. Baker has no more tea. Perhaps he will find some for our visit tomorrow. We said goodbye. I went back to my hotel. Just before dinner, Major Wentworth Caswell found me. It was impossible to avoid him. He insisted on buying me a drink and pulled two one-dollar bills from his pocket. Again, I saw a torn dollar fixed with blue paper with a corner missing. It was the one I gave Uncle Caesar. How strange, I thought. I wondered how Caswell got it. Uncle Caesar was waiting outside the hotel the next afternoon. He took me to Miss Adair's house and agreed to wait there until we had finished our business. Azalea Adair did not look well. I explained the agreement to her. She signed it. Then, as she started to rise from the table, Azalea Adair fainted and fell to the floor. I picked her up and carried her to the old red sofa. I ran to the door and yelled to Uncle Caesar for help. He ran down the street. Five minutes later, he was back with a doctor. The doctor examined Miss Adair and turned to the old black driver. Uncle Caesar, he said, run to my house and ask my wife for some milk and some eggs. Hurry. Then the doctor turned to me. She does not get enough to eat, he said. 
She has many friends who want to help her, but she is proud. Mrs. Caswell will accept help only from that old black man. He was once her family's slave. Mrs. Caswell, I said in surprise, I thought she was Azalea Adair. She was, the doctor answered, until she married Wentworth Caswell twenty years ago. But he's a hopeless drunk. He takes even the small amount of money that Uncle Caesar gives her. After the doctor left, I heard Caesar's voice in the other room. Did he take all the money I gave you yesterday, Mrs. Ilya? Yes, Caesar, I heard her answer softly. He took both dollars. I went into the room and gave Azalea a dare fifty dollars. I told her it was from the magazine. Then Uncle Caesar drove me back to the hotel. A few hours later, I went out for a walk before dinner. A crowd of people was talking excitedly in front of a store. I pushed my way into the store. Major Caswell was lying on the floor. He was dead. Someone had found his body on the street. He had been killed in a fight. In fact, his hands were still closed into tight fists. But as I stood near his body, Caswell's right hand opened. Something fell from it and rolled near my feet. I put my foot on it, then picked it up and put it in my pocket. People said they believed a thief had killed him. They said Caswell had been showing everyone that he had fifty dollars, but when he was found, he had no money on him. I left Nashville the next morning. As the train crossed a river, I took out of my pocket the object that had dropped from Caswell's dead hand. I threw it into the river below. It was a button, a yellow button, the one from Uncle Caesar's coat. <laughs> And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans, and I'm Ashley Thompson.